Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the dad of not one, but two Super Bowl champions. He is Michael Bennett Sr. And today we are going beyond Super Bowl champions. Hey, Michael, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Thank you for having me, Rusty. Happy to be here. Michael, I felt so happy to, to do a tennis training session for you last week when you were visiting Hawaii. And I want to ask you about this. I mean, it's extra special for any parent to have one Super Bowl champion son, but it is absolutely extraordinary for a parent to have two Super Bowl champion sons, and that's what you are. Now, is there just a handful of those in the history of the NFL? Yeah, it's not that many of us. I'm assuming it's about uh, 20 families or so. I haven't actually counted them, but I haven't found more than, than 20 families that have two sons that won Super Bowls. Now, I mean, and this is in the history of the NFL. I mean, I, we all know the Peyton Manning family. And, and I want to know, Michael, what shaped your character early on in life? Well, you know, growing up where I grew up, in, I grew up in a small, small town in Louisiana, population about 2,500. It was a close-knit group. We grew up by community. And uh, so that helped me when I became a father for that closeness that I grew up with to instill it in my boys. And I think that um, was one of the reasons why they were able to achieve because I was a hands-on dad. So it was, it was a good thing. Yeah, and, and I know that you were in the Navy and, and what, what were some of the lessons you learned during your time in the Navy? Uh, so the Navy was really what made me become a man. Uh, I enjoyed the Navy. You know, I began to travel the world and see different cultures and eat different foods, which I never saw where I grew up at. And uh, that enabled me to, to embrace different cultures and different foods and different people. And I began to get to understand the world better by joining the Navy. Now, I want to ask you about parenting champions now. What what were some key things that you did as a parent? Well, first, I mean, first, like I was, I was a sports fanatic. I love sports. I grew up in sports. Sports was, was you know, being a young black man growing up in, in America, sports was usually our way out. You know, that's the way we got to college. That's the way we achieved goals and, and met people. So, and my boys didn't have to do that. Luckily, we, we were able to provide for them, but, um, but I love sports, and, and so I, I got them in sports early. I was their coach for a while there. Up until about the seventh grade, I was, I was their coach. Um, I never, ever missed a practice. I, I, from, from the day they started playing basketball, football, I never missed a practice, and I, I enjoyed that. that. That actually made my, my day, you know, going to practice and, and watch them do, do what they do, and they enjoyed me being there. I remember a time when Mike was in the eighth grade, and he wanted these special cleats to play in the game with. So he called me at work. He's like, Dad, I want these shoes. He's like, all right. So I left work a little early and I tried to find his shoes and I couldn't find them. I couldn't. I went to store after store after store. And then finally I went to this last store. They had the shoes. And the game started about seven o'clock. I got to the stadium about 6.54. And I could see Michael looking in the stands, looking for me, looking for me. And when he saw me, his eyes just got huge. And I took the cleats that I had already laced them up for him. He put them on a, and he had a great game. He had about 300 yards that game. He was a really good running back there. Well, it must have been the shoes, right? <laughs> must have been the shoes, man, because he, he had about 300 yards and he, I don't know how many touchdowns, at least five touchdowns. He was unstoppable in that game. It was, it was a great feeling. Well, so let's talk about Michael Jr. now. We, I mean, you know I know him very well, but what are some reasons why he became a Super Bowl champion because he was undrafted in the NFL. Yes, Michael was, is, a, is a very hard worker. He's, Michael's a guy that, I know you coach him in tennis and you see how he, when, he, when you tell him he's not doing something right, he's going to make sure he does it right because he's a guy that when his back up against the wall, he comes out swinging. He's, a, he's really, really good when, when his back up against the wall. When he's, when he's out, out front, he don't really put the effort in, but when he's, when he's behind, He's a, he's, he's, you want him on your team. 
he's a great guy to have there. Uh, I, I watched him, you know, do this all his life. He's he's all he's just been a guy that he digs and digs and digs and digs, and he just keeps digging until he gets what he until he gets to go. We've all seen him. We've all seen his greatness on the field in the NFL, and I've been training him in tennis for over a year and a half now, and I get to see his greatness on the tennis court. And he's been making such a huge positive impact in society. I mean, what you see yeah. when you see Michael, he's so authentic. He's so real. I mean, what you see is what you get, right? Exactly. Well, he was raised that way. You know, we, we wasn't he wasn't raised in a household that was that he was raised in an inclusive household. Uh, all his friends were, in, I mean, on Father's Day, I, I usually get so many calls from all the guys that they were friends with growing up because I treated them all the same. They all come to my house. We had a great time here. We had a great time together. Um, and so he, he, he took that and he just built on that in his life, right? He, he's, he's very inclusive. He loves having people around. He, he, he just, he's just a genuine guy. And I, and I love the person he is. Uh, Martellus is an incredible athlete as well. I mean, he was one of the top recruits for basketball in, in addition to football, right? Yes, Martellus actually could have went to the NBA out of high school. He was going to get drafted. Um, the Miami Heat had called us and they told us they was going to draft me in the first round. Uh, and we was excited about that. And then they called me a few days later and said they would still will take him, but they'll take him in the second round. Um, and I, when they told us that, I really wanted him to go and go off to college, but I, I wanted him to go play basketball, right? I, I thought he was going to go to Duke. My successor was calling us every day. What is, what is Martellus going to do? What's Martellus going to do? I was like, coach, hope he goes. But he ended up going to Texas A&M. He actually played both uh, football and basketball there. They had a very good team there. He, they, they went to the Elite 16, his second year on the team. Uh, but, yeah, he could have gone to the NBA at high school. Now, I mean, everybody knows that Coach K is legendary. How, how were your interactions with Coach K during that time? Well, I, you know, for me, it was I, I, recruiting was overwhelming for me. So, I mean, from Coach Mac Brown to Coach K to Coach Bill Self to, I mean, just all these Les Miles, you know, all these coaches from all over these big time universities was coming to my house or calling on the phone. And so I began to just take it all with a grain of salt and just try to do what's best for, for Martellus. And, I, and, and so the, the coaches themselves, you know, it was great talking to them. But at the end of the day, I want to do what's best for him and, and not what's, what was best for a coach or a school. What I find really interesting, too, is both Michael Jr. and Martellus, they, they both played with Tom Brady. I mean, Tom Brady is the greatest of all time. And, I mean, Martellus the won, the, won the Super Bowl with Tom Brady and, and um, Michael played on for with the New England Patriots. I mean, what are some some things that that impresses you about Tom Brady? Well, I love I love his work ethic. I think Tom Brady is a great guy. I think he loves to compete. Um, he he just he has that no lose attitude, which which is a great thing to have when you playing sports. I th I just think he's a great guy. Now, being the greatest of all time, though, I'm pretty much he's not he's like my third guy when it comes to the quarterback position. But I really like him. I really like the way he he, he goes about his business. I, I just think he has that attitude that when I'm down, I'm still gonna. I'm still going to be able to win this game because he, he thinks he can win every time he step on a football field. So, so Michael, who might be in the top two of greatest of all time? Well, for the quarterback position, I, you know, I really love the San Francisco 49ers quarterback, Joe Montana. I thought Joe Montana was the greatest. Of, I mean, to watch that guy play. And, and, and at, the, at that time, the way the quarterbacks were treated, not like they're treated today. Today, you really can't hit a quarterback. But Joe Montana took a lot of hits and hung in there. And I thought he was a great quarterback. I love Joe Montana. And I, I used to love Jim Kelly, too. I thought he was a great quarterback when he went to Buffalo Bills. You go to four Super Bowls in a row, didn't win any of them. But, you know, just to get there four times in a row is an amazing feat itself. And I, I always loved the way Jim Kelly played the game. And so I don't know if he's greater than Tom Brady, but, I, you know, Jim, I, I'm always going to take – I'm always going to take the Joe Montana over, over Mark right now. And Michael, I, I feel so honored that, that you like my books. I mean, I want to I want to ask you about the books where, you, you know, obviously you know that I speak a lot about the importance of mindset and the brain controls the body. And what are your thoughts about really having the right mindset to really explore your potential for greatness? Well, you know, your, your book does point out, and actually, 
I, I introduced your book to a couple of friends of mine I, I, for their kids. I wanted their kids to read the book because I felt like, you know, they was going through some things with their boys and I felt like they should read this book and it'll help them along the way, even in business. Um, but, but for me, I, I think um, that the mindset of, of being, not being defeated is a great mindset because I will, you can think one way and, but your mind can put you in a different position and then you can always, you got the, you know, the devil on the one shoulder, angel on the other shoulder, which one are you gonna listen to? So I just feel like, you know, the mindset is, is, the, is, the, is the tool that, that can prepare you to greatness or it can prepare you to lotusness. Now, when, when you reflect back on Michael and Martellus, how, what was, was there like a turning point for them where they just really got into that right mindset to really excel with, with their sport? Yes. And I was at the practice when Michael got his. I think Martellus was just born with it. Like he was just like, he always wanted to be competitive. He just always wanted to compete. He didn't care who was on the other side of him. He just felt like he could beat the next, that person over there. And Michael is, he's, he's, you know, he has that mindset of he just want everybody to be included. He want to be friends with everybody. And so I'm at practice one day and uh, it was, it was about four or five dads that went to every practice. And so, and it just happened this day, this, this dad is, he's standing next to me. His son is an offensive lineman and Michael's a defensive lineman and they're going at it at practice, right? And, um, and, and Michael's going at this guy, and he, 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 and I can see that he's not really giving his all because he just wants his teammate to shine a little bit. And I yell something to him, you got to win every play. And then after that, he, he, he whooped the guy, and then they actually get into a fist fight on the football field. You know, the coach broke it up really quick. And then after practice, I said, now, you ready? Because now I see, because at practice, that's the time you want to shine, and that's the time you want your teammates to shine at the same time. But at the, you need them to grow as a team. Because if, if they think they're better than what they really are, or they don't think they're as good as they really are, when they get on, when they get in competition, they might not be able to let their light shine. And so when Michael did that, I told him at home that I said, "You ready now?" And that was his moment. And after that moment, he became he became a great football player at that moment. Yeah, I I agree with you because I think a lot of athletes who achieve greatness, I mean, they're. Uh, there comes a moment in their lives where it's it's really pivotal, pivotal, like you said. And and you know when I when I have my interactions with Michael on the tennis court, I mean, there's a difference between giving 100 percent and giving 1,000 percent effort. And he really yes. gives that 1,000 percent effort every time. Don't don't you agree? I definitely agree with that. And and you know that was something that, as I said, Michael he he learned it along the way. But once he got it, and, and 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 he studies really hard about the game of football. He 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 can he. We talk about the. He'll call me sometime doing halftime. Dad, what I'm doing wrong? I say, well, this is what's happening. You need to do this. You need to do that. And he goes out in the field. I can see the third quarter. He's using it when I what I what I told him because when I watch him play or when I watch Martellus play, I watch the game from a different perspective than most fans are watching the football game. I'm 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 watching it from a mindset. I'm seeing him. I'm seeing his body language. I'm, I'm watching his movements, and I'm, I'm seeing how he's adjusted to the competition. And I can help him doing it. Like at halftime, when he calls me, I can tell him, "Look, this is what's going on. You need to do A, B, C." And then it works for him almost every single time. And Michael, I, I gotta say, my, I mean, Michael really listens so well. I mean, and he he just wants whatever he does. He wants to be the greatest at it. And I want to ask you about this, Michael. You know, we've all had adversities and challenges in our lives. What's a big adversity that you faced in your life? Well, for me, um, you know, when I when I was young and in the military, um, I, I was I became a single parent and uh, just being a single dad with, with the boys living in California, no family around. It was it was tough. But but at the same time, it helped me grow to, to be a better person, to be a better father, to be a better man, because that it, I had no choice. I had to get it or die, right? So, you know, not die in the sense of dying, but just, you know, I, I had to achieve. And so that moment, you know, being a single dad, it helped me become, the, become a, a, a better father. Uh, and, and I can see that because when I'm talking with you, you know, in your previous trip to Hawaii, um, it seems like you have that discipline 
that, you know, to, that you're going to succeed no matter what, like failure is not an option. And so I can see that you becoming a single dad. I mean, you weren't going to fail at it. You're only going to succeed, right? Yes, definitely. But, you know, having said that, you know, having, having met a woman that, you know, came into my life that became the mother that the boys really wanted and became a great woman in their life. You know, she was, she was, she was, she was instrumental in their growth and becoming the people that they are today. So yes, by myself, I was, I was, I was destined to win, but when she came along, I knew I was going to win. Yeah. <laughs> hey, great women. They, they make a big difference. <laughs> That's yes, for sure. Do. Now, yes, Michael, when you reflect back on your life so far, what's, what's a valuable lesson you learned? Well, I, I, I learned that, you know, looking back on my life, to, to be very honest with yourself, you know, like I, I feel like a lot of times people are not honest with themselves. You know, you, you can lie to others, but if you lie to yourself, you're never going to achieve, you know, what you need to achieve because you, you can you can lie to yourself and make you feel like you're better than what you are. You can lie to yourself, make you feel like you're worse than you are. But I feel like if, you, if you're honest with yourself, you can achieve what you want to achieve in life. Yeah, and I can see that with you because I mean you're a man of great character and and you know you're very authentic and genuine and respectful. I mean you you you're a man of honor is what I what I really want to say. And uh, Michael, what would be your advice to parents? I, my advice to parents, you know, I, I talk to a lot of parents, you know, all the time. I think that the thing is just be there for your kids. You know, support them and, and, and help them grow. Be supportive, you know, and, and don't be cheap when it comes to your, your kids. Like, if you need to spend some money to go do something with them, spend the money to go do something with them. You know, don't hold back when it comes down to your children and just be very supportive, be there for them. And, and most of the time, people, when, when kids with this, a certain age, parents begin to become hands off. I say when they became, when they begin 15 and 16 and 17, 18, you need to be more hands on then than you were when they was 12, right? Because now they need you more because now the decisions that they're making can be life-changing decisions, you know, as opposed to, as opposed to a 12-year-old making a decision about going to school to that school, but a 70-year-old making a decision it could be a life-changing decision for, for that 17-year-old. Now, let's flip it. Uh, what would be your advice to young boys and girls? So, you know, I, 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 you know, I tell Michael, to, and Michael Moore tells us all the time, First of all, you need to be a great reader. You need to read books and, and understand life. Um, but but set goals, put your write your goals down, and uh, try to make steps at your goal. See some growth in your in your life with your goals that you want to achieve. Set put something down. I want to I want to be this in this amount of time, and make that thing happen. You know, keep up with yourself, and just focus on your goals, and you and you can achieve them. Now, I've, I've always told my teams that, you know, self-discipline is super, super important because self-discipline leads to habits, which lead to success. Now, that's exactly what happened with Martellus and Michael. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes. They're, they're, one thing about Michael and Martellus, they're, they're very disciplined boys. Now, when they were younger, I remember uh, Martellus coming home one day and said, Dad, we want to go to this party. I was like, okay, who's going to be at the party? They always start naming these folks. And I said, well, I don't know none of those people, but okay, you guys can go. And uh, so I let them go. And then about 20 minutes later, I show up at the party, right? And it's like, I, it's like, Dad, what are you doing here? Well, I just want to know who's here, what's going on. And I just want to meet the parents, make sure somebody's up in here. Uh, to this day, they don't want to go to parties anymore because they think I'm going to show up. Like, Dad's going to show up. We're not going. <laughs> so, so, you know, that just, that just helped them understand, like, you know, yeah, you can have fun, but you need to have good, clean fun. You need to understand the people you're around, understand what's happening around you. And, and so now, you know, they, even to this day, they don't even like to go out. They're just more of just home by the men. And you know what I don't like nowadays is how, you know, kids receive participation trophies. I mean, and, and they know they don't deserve that. I mean, there's, there's something, you know, really good about, working hard for something that you want to achieve and really get that trophy, no matter what sport you play. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't agree with participation trophies. I think, I think kids should work. And I mean, 
you don't get an A for showing up in class. You get an A for doing the work, right? You, just because you showed up, oh, you get an A. You don't, you don't get that. You have to work for that A. And just like you, but a lot of times the, the grownups out there, they, they do those things to, for money. And so kids could be more, you get more participants and parents like to see these kids show up, even though they're not getting anything out of it. I just think, you know, kids should, kids should know where they are, know where they are. When they're playing sports, they should know where they are, how they need to grow and what they need to, to get better in it. Because if you don't, if they get a trophy, like, oh, I'm good. Well, you, and then when they get to high school or middle school, they're not, and they see all this other competition, they can't compete. And so I, I feel like I don't, I don't like that that participation trophy thing. I just feel like the kids should achieve and, and then get awarded for achieving. Michael, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up. Um, it's, and it's about greatness. I mean, you've been around greatness, you know, all your life. How do you define greatness? I think when I look at greatness, I, a lot of people look at, you know, like, like my boys win the Super Bowl or, or Muhammad Ali winning a match or, you know, Tom Brady winning, winning rings. I feel like greatness is that journey to get to that point because it, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of work just to get to that point, to be in that game, to be in that final match. It takes that work. It takes the practice. It takes discipline. And so I think to achieve greatness, you have to, you have to, be, you have to set these goals and you have to try to achieve these goals and get better and better and better. And then when you get to that final pinnacle of your career and you winning, that's when you achieve, that's when you achieve greatness. Michael, you are a great dad and you are a fantastic example of what a parent should be. And you are someone that definitely goes beyond the lines. And I want to thank you for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me, Russ. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Michael and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.